I'm Mike Granoff, the founder of Manif Mobility. We're a venture capital fund that invests in, guess what? Uh, everything mobility. Uh, we're based here in Israel, but we invest globally uh, across all sectors of mobility, and it's an honor to um, host this panel. By the way, I think I'm now the third person on stage this morning who was associated with Better Place. Uh, funny thing is, the bankruptcy was 10 years ago tomorrow. <laughs> And uh, it's unbelievable the, the reverberations that continue, not just as was discussed from the people who were involved, but also from uh, obviously the whole electrical, uh, electrification trend. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about today. First of all, I want to ask uh, the audience, how many people here uh, own an electric car? So this is a fair number. But now let me ask the opposite of the question that I used to ask because I used to ask people if their next car was going to be an EV. How many people, their next car is for sure going to be an internal combustion engine car? Raise your hand. So we have, a, we have still a few holdouts. OK, interesting to know. But uh, I think it's a, a lot lower number than we would have had a year ago, and certainly uh, three or five years ago. So um, let's begin uh, with the by introducing uh, the panel and uh, talk about everybody's background and then we're gonna get into the meat of the matter around uh, EVs today and in the future. So Sanjay, would you like to kick us off? Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, uh, so thank you, Michael. And uh, I think uh, when, you, when you said who'll buy an ICE, I think it may be alternate fuels. <laughs> so we may be on the right track. It may not be combustion in, in that sense. But you know, um, coming from uh, the India perspective, we're the third largest uh, automobile market in the world with 80% fossil fuel and 20% renewable and quickly moving towards carbon neutral, quickly moving towards uh, you know, uh, renewable energy will generate 5 million tons of green hydrogen by 2030, uh, which is you know, pretty phenomenal. We've had a great growth uh, in India. Uh, from the component sector, uh, you know, we're close to about $60 billion in terms of revenue. Um, and that's you know growing year on year. Uh, we expect the automotive market in India to grow at about 11%, um, and the EV market to grow pretty rapidly. We're about a million EVs today, um, predominantly in the two-wheeler and three-wheeler segment, and a very small percentage of that uh, is in, in passenger car. However, that is increasing. We're seeing a lot of alternate fuel uh, opportunities and options come into India. Um, uh, you know, to play in India. So I think from an India perspective, uh, we've also got a very strong IT industry uh, that's, you know, been around for 40 years, never had any IP issues. Uh, so great, uh, you know, talent pool, a lot of software development. However, with the disruption that's happening uh, in India, Israel is very well placed or positioned to bring technology to India, which we can manufacture on scale. Uh, you know, and again, we've got a large market space uh, something that um, you know doesn't exist here in Israel. However, the technology that we could adopt for a large market space is what really the integration we'd like to see. We have 15 companies, uh, you know, here today, uh, and this is just the beginning. It's a small start for what comes next. There's a great interest in terms of adopting technologies uh, from the Indian context, uh, you know. And is, with regard to batteries, if you talk about batteries, it's like we've got 10 or 12 companies in battery manufacturing. We've got a lot of technology transfer happening uh, you know, from here uh, to India. So again, you know, we're at that uh, tipping point, I would say, with a lot of um, investment from government for deep localization, for investment in future technologies, for exports, to really to create a manufacturing hub. It's a great you know, destination to manufacture. Uh, uh, out of. Uh, Kirsten, why don't you give a, tell us a little bit about yourself first of all, and then uh, give us uh, your kind of 10, 30,000 foot perspective on, on the uh, world of EVs today, and then we'll begin to drill down a little deeper. Happy to. So I'm Kirsten. I'm a partner with McKinsey. I lead the McKinsey Center for Future Mobility, which is our think tank on the mobility disruption. We do work with automotive companies, with companies in different industries, but also with a lot of startups and scale-ups. That's the reason why we're here today. Um, personally, I didn't raise my hand, and I wouldn't have raised my hand had I been in the audience, because I don't have a car. And I used to be a big car guy. I used to drive eight-cylinder cars and love it. But today and now, I've decided that 
I don't need a car anymore. I can get by with mobility as a service. I can get by with a lot of e-scooters, micro-mobility, and other devices. Nonetheless, happy to share sort of our view. Um, I think in our mind, we're going to go 100% EV, period. The question is when. And the question is a bit, how is it going to play out over the different parts of the world? And then there's another sub-question, is there still going to be something like hydrogen also in the pass car segment? And then there might be a small segment, but ultimately in our mind, we're going to go 100% EV. And we do believe that all of the forecasts we have at the moment, um, where sort of we're going to go 100% EV sales by 2028, 2030, 2035, depending on the country, depending on the legislation, they're actually going to accelerate even further. Why? Because if we do look at climate change, if we do look at the 1.5 degree target, and if we do look at uh, how far we're off as a transportation sector, there is no way that we're going to be able to close that gap only by introducing EVs at scale. This can only happen if we actually do a bit of a cash for clunkers for ICE vehicles eventually, one, or if we significantly, and then coming back to my non-car ownership anymore, reduce the number of cars on the road, and ultimately get people into different modes of transport. And that's why I've been hanging out a lot in the autonomous technology area, because in our mind, shared autonomous transport, pooled autonomous transport that's also electric, is actually going to have the potential to change the way how we get from A to B, and also help us as a society, as humanity, achieve some part of the climate change targets. So, Kirsten, I have to say, um, you've kind of forced me to reveal my own secret, which is that I also um, don't really drive a car very much uh, anymore. I commute into Tel Aviv every day, and that would be a completely, it would be completely lost time if I chose to drive, uh, do it. So I use a various forms of mass transit, once in a while a uh, bike or get a ride. Um, but uh, I, I agree with you that, um, you know, the, it's not necessarily given that everybody is going to need to have their own, their own car, uh, given the plethora of options that digitization and mobility has brought us. And with that, let's get to my good friend Chris. We've talked about these issues for many years, and uh, now we've seen some real movement uh, in, in the numbers. Uh, I'm going to get to them in, in a moment, but um, the, the most interesting, I think, is that in 2022 we did achieve the mark of 10% EVs globally. Um, Little known fact, in 2006, I said we'd hit that mark in 2012, so I got the question, do you get to say I told you so if you were a decade late in your prediction? But in any event, Chris, talk to us about uh, your views generally on EVs, and then we'll start talking about numbers and, and China and so forth. Sure. Well, it seems that this is a stage of secrets, uh, because as a good son of Detroit in the United States, I also do not own a car. Um, which is rare in Detroit for those of you that know, and it's, the reason is, is because we are global investors in mobility. We want to understand what's happening and why it's happening and what works and doesn't, and so we're big believers you have to be a part of that ecosystem. But I will say just really quickly, as we start to get chippy, I do think that we're, in no way will we go all EV. And I like the rationale as to why that, that could be a theme we support, but powertrains globally, I think we're going to utilize all of the above, and we're going to utilize the ecosystem and the supply chains for petro and a variety of other types of fueling issues on a forward-going basis in a real way. Um, but before we get too deep, I'm Chris Thomas. I'm a, I'm a co-founder and partner with Assembly Ventures, first transatlantic mobility fund in the world. Our team sits across Detroit, Berlin, and Silicon Valley. We're a little different in that we invest in air, land, sea, and space. We define mobility as the physical and digital movement of people, goods, data, and energy. So we're really looking at those intersections. And our firm exists for two reasons. One, we believe that there is a very real bifurcation happening from east to west. So the US and China in particular, but across the eastern and the western world holistically, and the manufacturing logistics and supply chain opportunities that will come out of that from a technology enablement perspective are going to be profound, whether through allied sourcing or on-sourcing. And two, we have an abiding belief in the legacy western industrial centers. So Munich, Turin, Detroit, Pittsburgh, Tokyo, Seoul. If those individuals and, and P&Ls make the right partnership decisions, they can remain relevant by partnering with the Silicon Valleys and the Tel Avivs of the world. And so our portfolio goes across the mobility landscape within the way in which we see the space. Everything from real-time payment in any automotive environment, uh, recycling of end-of-use automotive or other industrial assets in which you get complete reuse of ferrous and non-ferrous metals, plastics, batteries. How do you help large corporations beginning in Berlin and Germany better utilize all of the mobility benefits going to their consumers? But important for this discussion, our, our very first investment, Arnext Energy, uh, 
a U.S. provider of both pack and cell manufacturing as well as the energy storage. A couple months ago, we just announced a $300 million round at a $1.2 billion valuation. The first round that was done for this business was in September of 21. So incredible growth, a $1.6 billion gigafactory in the state of Michigan, talking about why I believe strongly in the West, especially in the Americas and Europe, we need to be focused on owning all aspects of our production and ensuring that we are not reliant from a geopolitical perspective on other actors that may not have our best interest at heart. That was a perfect segue, Chris, to the direction I want to go in. So I mentioned that uh, 2022, we had 10% global sales uh, EVs. And uh, my own conjecture, just looking at the numbers from the first quarter, is that amazingly, even though Israel had an overhang from Better Place and was slow to get going on uh, EV adoption, it is catching up very quickly. And I think this year could actually hit 25% of new car sales being EVs. But one interesting thing about that, about 70% of those Chinese yes. EVs. Most of the rest of it Tesla, and there are others as well. Um, so in 2009, when I was with Better Place and hanging out a lot in Washington, D.C., uh, I was uh, starting to talk about what uh, you were just sort of referring to, which is the industrial poli policy that the Chinese were beginning to adopt around EVs. And in fact, uh, if you go to tinyurl.com slash China EVs, you'll come to a New York Times article from April 1st, 2009. I set up the tiny URL because I talked about it incessantly for years, and it said China's make a big bet in EVs. And it made a lot of sense because China was sk uh, skyrocketing on car adoption at that time. They had never developed an in inter incumbent industry around internal combustion. They were good at batteries, and they understood that this was an incredible competitive advantage, an opportunity to do for 21st century automotive what the US did to 20th century automotive. And I, um, with at better place interest at heart, with the U.S. interest at heart at the time, uh, was trying to get the Obama administration to actually conditioned a bailout of General Motors on being an EV company and some other things which didn't happen. And so here we are. And interestingly enough, the same person that wrote that article in the New York Times in 2009 wrote a follow-up piece last week that some of you may have seen. It got a lot of play. It had some very neat graphics. But what it painted was a picture of China having succeeded in that industrial policy. And in fact, 54% of all EVs made today are made in China. They control 73% of cobalt refining uh, and, and two-thirds of all battery production. And, and in fact, I think the title of the article last week was Can the World Make an EV Without China? I think the answer today is not easily. So I want to get into this uh, a, a bit. And um, Sanjay, talk to us a, a little bit about from an Indian perspective. You're now the most populous country in the world, no longer China. Um, how do you view the state of EVs, as Chris was referring to, from a geopolitical perspective? Yeah, so, you know, that, that's, that's a good point. So we uh, are also aware of the fact that, uh, you know, China plays a big role when it comes to batteries, when it comes to magnets, uh, you know, and, and the endeavor is to reduce our dependence on any kind of import. And that's really, uh, from that perspective, we're adopting technologies uh, and I'll give you an example of motors. We're looking at magnetless motors. You know, how do you reduce dependence on imports is one of the key driving forces behind all the tech that's happening in India and all the technology investments that are happening in India. And uh, if, you know, I'll give you an example. We had um, 800 companies showing at the Auto Expo this year, earlier this year. We had zero companies from China. Uh, participating, so we're we're you know uh, progressively increasing the kind of technology that we're investing, so that we don't have to import. Uh, you know, and this is happening across the globe. I feel uh, localization is playing a big role, uh, and uh, and you know we'll continue to do that. Uh, and therefore, alternate fuels has become such a big driver, uh, not necessarily EV uh, in the in the BEV sense. Uh, you know, till we find the right solutions to reduce dependence, but alternate fuels is also something that the government is pushing in India. So that's really from, from our perspective. Kirsten, what do you think about the um, dominance of China in EVs today? Is it sustainable? So um, the, the number that, that stuck with me was uh, German market car sales, uh, electric vehicle share, China versus the rest. 30% um, market share, roughly 25% market share for Chinese OEMs in April, up 3x from last year. 
And that's, you can see that on the streets of Israel right now. You, you can, right? And in Israel, it's, it's even more dominant, right? If you go to Norway, one of the early EV adopting companies, you find cars on the road that I at least, and well, I used to be a car guy at least, I didn't know, right? And honestly, if, if you think back, so if I think back to 15 years ago, close to 15 years ago, I was helping a large German automotive company set up their or expand their production facilities in, in China, in Beijing. Um, we, uh, and, and back then they celebrated, it was a political act, an export of a first Chinese made vehicle to I think a country in, uh, in South America. And the question was always, would these vehicles be exported? And all my automotive clients said, no way, it will never happen. We will never be exporting vehicles from China to the world. And now I think this has completely flipped. Even established OEMs that aren't Chinese are considering uh, producing vehicles, even developing vehicles in China and then exporting them from China for the world because it is in many ways a lead market. And it's not only a lead market for EVs and powertrain technologies, it is also a lead market for software. If you compare what the, what the different vehicles can do in terms of vehicle software, if you think about Tesla, if you think about Chinese OEMs, and then also uh, automotive OEMs from Europe, you can see that there are some differences in the software. And I'm not going to say which one I think is best, but uh, I think you can infer a bit. So I think, um, yes, it is definitely a good way uh, of doing economic policy to try and reduce the dependency on foreign countries. But honestly, if I just see the uptake in electric vehicles from China and also the software dominance, I have a hard time believing that uh, there is anything really meaningful that can be done against it. And I'm also wondering if it should be, because maybe the technology is even better. Well, uh, let me just follow up with that uh, and ask you, what are the current European policies on import of Chinese EVs? And then, Chris, follow up from that on what you think the, the, well, you've made pretty clear what you think the policy should be, uh, I think, but you expand on that a bit. But first, let's, uh, Kirsten, tell us what the, what the facts are. So I think I, I can take this very shortly. I mean, there are very, very few policies, right? I think what is trying to be done is uh, simply increase the attractiveness of, um, uh, of the local production, trying to increase the attractiveness also of producing batteries locally and so on. And then maybe it's much better to talk about what it should be if, if there should be any economic policies or not. Yeah, because and we're talking about the two geographies that you play most in are both geographies in which the automotive industry is a fundamental sure. part of the underbelly Absolutely. of the economy. So, And just for the record, you can still be a car guy without owning a car. <laughs> Don't sell yourself short. <laughs> uh, and so from, from our perspective, it's a really, it's a really interesting question because I think when you talk about policymakers in the West and you talk about what they should be doing, Usually the discussions go to secure of raw materials and differentiated supply chains. You talk about, from a policy perspective, how do you think about transition through economic policy? I would argue that there's actually things that are more important as to what policymakers should be doing, or maybe more importantly, kind of going from this morning's events, what we as citizens, what we as, as members of the West should be demanding of our policymakers. So first and foremost, I think we need to be incredibly serious about ridding ourselves of unmerited patronage. And what I mean by that, we have individuals that sit in secretary or ministry positions across the Western world who have no experience in the sectors in which they are overseeing. In the United States, for example... Not here in Israel. That never happens. I, no, of course not. Uh, present company accepted, of course. Um, in the United States, uh, we have individuals who are overseeing huge swaths of our economy, but within transportation and energy in particular, who have never actually worked in those industries. I think, that's a, I think that's a problem. I think we need to make sure, patronage is always going to be a part of politics. You're going to surround yourself with individuals who are looking to move the world in the, in the direction you want to move it. But we must demand expertise and excellence in those sectors. And if they do not have that, we must call it out strongly. Two, I think we have to make sure we're having, from a policymaker perspective, so it's an interesting positioning, we need to make sure, and those individuals need to make sure, they are having intimate discussions with everyone in this room, with people like us, who care deeply about where this sector is going, who understand the technology. And if we don't understand it, we're creating it and making sure that we're having those serious discussions. And so on an annual basis, we have an assembly summit. We were chosen this year to be the first group outside of the IAA in Munich to actually be alongside them since they were founded in 1897. Why did they do that? It's because they care about intimate discussions that matter, like we have on the phone all the time, but that frankly many policymakers don't. And so being a part of those discussions are really important. And then the last thing I would say is I think we need to be incredibly honest about 
what it is we believe, and we need to play to win. Often in the West, we play not to lose. We play it safe. We have to be honest about our enemies. We have to be honest about our allies. And we need to run together and win. And if we do that, we're going to move the world in the direction we want across air, land, sea, and space. I knew time would run away with us in this conversation, but let's just end with a lightning round. 2033, what percentage new car sales in India will be electric? Uh, new car sales, I would say almost uh, 30 percent. In, in, uh, 25 percent in fast car. Mm -hmm. I'd say about 80, 90 percent in three wheelers and uh, 70 percent in two wheelers. And Kirsten, um, what, what's your prediction? We come back EcoMotion 2033. What's global uh, EV sale penetration? I'd say globally around 50 plus percent, with several countries at 100 percent. And I think we're not going to get here by our individual cars. We're going to go here by get here by robo shuttle. Sure. What do you think? 2033. Where are we at? I, I like the. I think the 20 to, or rather 30 to 40 percent penetration makes sense. But the the bogey that I'll take is I think hydrogen is going to be upwards of 10 to 15 as it relates to heavy industrial trucks. And it's we're just at the cusp of some really interesting technologies breakthroughs there. As usual, I'll take the over on all of that. Um, just two uh, <laughs> thoughts to conclude. One is, um, as an Israeli who's also an American, don't count the U.S. out yet. Uh, the U.S. has a tendency, when it finally gets down the problem, to scale very quickly. We will see a lot of action uh, in catching up uh, some policy that uh, started last year. I think will impact that a lot. So that's something to keep an eye on. And the last thought I'll leave you with when we talk about supply chain, and we didn't get into minerals and everything going into the batteries, but uh, polymetallic nodules in the Pacific Ocean. Keep that in mind, and find me later, and we can talk more about it. I'll leave you on that intriguing note. Thank you very much for the panel, you, for a terrific discussion. Thank you. Thank you for your eco motion.